we're back. This is Think Tech. I'm Jay Fidel. It's 5 p.m. on a given Wednesday. We have we have John David Ann here from HBU history professor to take us down the path of history to understand things we would not otherwise understand. Welcome to the show. We love having you here, John. Yay, it's good to be here. Thanks for you know having me on. And um, yeah, it's good to do a show. You know, we need to do a show now to talk a bit about uh, the elections are over right now. The Kind of the political lines have been redrawn, and uh, I think it's an interesting time to do a little what I would call contemporary history, and actually look not so much for historical perspective by going back to the deep past and you know drawing lessons from it, but but actually look at the last forty years of politics and look at the way that the American political system has shifted over time. Uh, you know we we you know. I know there's a lot of talk about what what a kind of a, a transformative moment this is in American politics, and uh, you know, I, yes and no. I'm not quite so convinced that it's a complete transformation. Look, I've I've seen a lot of history. Okay, when I, you know, I study the American Revolution, you know, the political crises of the late 18th century. Uh, the rise of abolitionism and the battles and the violence that that, that included the, the secessionism and the Civil War. I mean, even Abraham Lincoln's igno uh, interregnum, right? The the time, the very long time, actually, it was actually uh, much longer than today because, of course, the president was inaugurated on March fourth. Even that was actually, believe it or not. It was uh, the threat of violence hung over that whole thing a lot more than even what happened uh, in 2021. So, because um, because mostly it wasn't violent. There was the violence, of course, on January 16th. But other than that, it was a lot of lawsuits, right? And a lot of protests. Even, even <laughs> this is interesting, even uh, uh, the supporters of Lincoln, Lincoln, you know, took this long train trip before he got to Washington, D.C. He started, I think, on February 8th and went to, uh, to, to Cincinnati and Cleveland and, and Buffalo and other these and, and Columbus and all these all these kind of Midwestern states that had been kind of the bedrock of his support. And he was nearly crushed to death in Buffalo by his adoring crowds. <laughs> so Sometimes the violence is completely inadvertent. I mean, people really, there was actually a stampede in Buffalo and people got hurt uh, in the process. So uh, th that didn't happen this time around. Thankfully, Joe Biden was not, you know, crushed under the crowds. We didn't have crowds because of COVID and because of security con uh, concerns. So, uh, but yeah, I think, uh, you know, a, a discussion about where we might be headed, what this particular time looks like, uh, and uh, what are the changes? What are the what's staying the same? Yeah, good, Jay. Well, you know, it, it it points up your story about Lincoln and all that, and the interregnum and threats, whatnot. It points up that um, you know the transfer of power inherent in a democracy right. is is central. It's like they say, you know. Congress and representative government and the capital that's central, but but even more critical to it is the transfer of power, peaceful transfer of power. And you know, in our lifetimes, yours and mine and the people we know, um, there's been really no issue about the transfer of power. Uh, and, and you really have to look way back to find a time when there was an issue. But right. reality is this reminds us, the whole affair reminds us that we really have to preserve a peaceful transfer of power. We cannot tolerate what happened on January 6th. It's too risky. You know, I personally, I felt the bullet whiz by my ear. I think the country felt the bullet whiz by our ear. Yeah. It could have just as easily gone the wrong way. If yeah. anybody had been, you know, assassinated, if they had in fact stopped the vote, or taken over the Capitol for any length of time, our entire system would have been threatened. And really the question is whether it is still threatened by the events that followed. We're not, I keep saying, we're not out of the woods. Congress is, Congress is a sick puppy. May I say that, a sick puppy. And we're gonna find next Wednesday that they, they uh, exonerate him. 
in that uh, Senate trial, that's a five, um, there's going to be no conviction. And this, that really tells us and the world just exactly how, how much a sick puppy our Congress is. Yeah, and so this is yeah. something that, that has to be marked in history. Yeah, so, you know, I, I'm, I'm a little more kind of, uh, I'm not quite so, I, I don't feel quite so negatively about the current situation. Um, yes, the insurrection could have been much worse. On the other hand, uh, you know, they kind of got what they planned for. They, there wasn't, they clearly wasn't a, a deep plan to take over the, the, uh, the, the Congress and the Capitol. Uh, it was uh, more kind of, uh, you know, uh, mercenary types and true believers who just kind of on an impulse stormed in. There was maybe a little bit of planning. There was some, you know, talk about weaponry and stuff, but they're, you know, they could have done a lot of things to plan this thing. So part of me thinks, you know, if that's the best they've got, then they're really not a huge threat to the Republic, to the, to the survival of the Republic. But but yes, we definitely, we have to take it seriously. Um, but I think that one of the, you know, the, the, the long-term impact of this, because this is, you know, this it's never happened before. And, and this is going to stay in the political memory of, of, you know, both Democrats and Republicans. So uh, one of the long-term impacts, I think, is that the Republican Party has got a lot of explaining to do for a long time. Because while there's a lot of things that, uh, that America, you know, politics is, you know, kind of the, the soup of the day, soup du jour, right? You know, so, uh, but this was beyond politics. As you pointed out, this was about the political system itself. It was beyond any political issue, right? It was about the, sur the sustenance, the survivability of the political system. And therefore, I think this will stick with Americans and it's going to reflect quite frankly, reflect badly on the Republicans because there's, you know, the a Republican president incited this mob to this insurrection. So, um, so that I think actually in the long run is gonna play in the favor of the Democrats. Now, let me sketch something out for you, Jay. Uh, so, so this is what I think uh, has happened in, let, let's take the long, long view and then we can dig into various spots of this and we can, talk politics and debate it. Uh, the, so the long view is that since the 1980s, uh, the Republicans have been, or let's say conservatives have been dominant in this country. Uh, they still compose, uh, you know, they're about 35% of the, 34% of the, the public and liberals are about 26%. So. Now, liberalism has grown in popularity in, in recent time, but it's still behind conservatives. So we've been living with this conservative paradigm for about 40 years. But I would argue that the conservative paradigm has begun, began to come apart in, in George W. Bush's uh, presidency. It started to come apart because he mishandled uh, well, the, the whole Iraq war was just a fiasco. And we know that, you know, when he left the White House, his, his approval ratings were in the range of, you know, like 25%. So uh, it was, uh, you know, it was a bad moment. And of course, the thing that we get then is uh, we get this kind of change candidate um, out of that and in, a, in Barack Obama. And so what we can say about Obama is Obama uh, maybe in some ways underperformed, maybe early on when he could have, when he had a chance, he really had a chance to move the electorate. He didn't move the electorate into the Democratic category as much as he could have because he was maybe a little too conventional. He went to Washington with the goal of kind of, okay, let's all get along, right? There's no blue and red. There's just Americans. That's a nice idea. But honestly, uh, you, you know, this, this thought that you somehow you can go there and you can, you know, get people to hold hands and sing Kumbaya. I'm not insulting Obama. Okay. He's, he's, I like Obama, but look, it's not kumbaya there. It's about how politics is played. And I think, I think Obama kind of, well, he was young, he was inexperienced. And I think you saw that inexperience in his attempt. Let me give a specific example. Obama spent maybe almost six months trying to get, convince Republicans 
that they should sign on to some version of, of the Affordable Care Act. And he spent six months and lots of political capital believing that, that this had to be done in a bipartisan way. And he, what did he get for it? Nothing. He got nothing for it. Uh, so they had to, in the end, they had to do it Democrats only, wasted a lot of political capital, kind of got behind the eight ball. So, so I, you know, I think this idea of, you know, let's all work together is, is over, it's, it's kind of, the, the value of it's exaggerated. And that's not to say that people shouldn't get along, but in politics, politics is, a, is about leverage. It's about being able to appeal to uh, various, you know, constituencies with your policies. And it's really, it's never about uh, saying nice things because except for an occasional, you know, really brilliant speech. And Obama had a few of those actually. Uh, it's, it's really about, you know, what you can get done. It's kind of the art of the doable. So, so Obama had more, I, I would compare Obama's opportunity to that of Franklin Roosevelt. And Obama's problem is he was reading books on Abraham Lincoln not Franklin Roosevelt. Now, Joe Biden and his administration, they're reading books on Franklin Roosevelt. And I think that's the right choice. I still think that this is a moment where, where this is a kind of a Rooseveltian moment where, where the electorate can be, there's a fungibility in the electorate. You talked about a transformative moment, but I do think there's a fungibility. There's a, there's a softness in, in the electorate. And I think uh, the electric can be persuaded to move. And that's what Roosevelt did in the 1930s with his policies. Uh, and I think the Democrats still have that chance to make that happen. And that's part of, you know, so, so just to, you know, I'm talking a lot, Jay. I think what's going on is um, the end of that conservative political system, the Reagan type political system really began to wind down with Obama. And uh, we see now uh, that I think for a while, at least we're gonna see some political parity between the parties. And that's, that's one thing that has happened in history and political system as well. But at least for the moment, the Democrats have the upper edge and uh, the upper hand. And if they can, they can embrace this Rooseveltian moment and push forward, uh, with policies that appeal to, you know, to working people, to uh, social progressives, to environmental progressives, if they can push, if they're successful with those type of policies, then they've got a chance to move a, a majority of Americans into their category. Uh, so, um, yeah, so that's- Well, that's, I, I, when I was saying that Congress was the sick puppy, I was really saying, the Republicans are a sick puppy. I mean, what you what you have now is a very strange thing. I don't. <laughs> you can, you know, you can comment on whether it has existed before, but you have one party that wants to serve the public, whether they're, you know, finding best ways to do that or not. It's very clear that they want to serve the public. The other party wants to serve themselves, whatever that is, and it's. It's kind of Looney Tunes right now. Uh, they want to perpetuate their power. They want to stop the Democrats uh, for any achievement whatsoever. Yep. <laughs> it's a very odd, you know, it's a very odd configuration. And, and, I, and I suggest that, that in, in order to go forward and continue our democracy and sort of mm, uh, re, refine ourselves, rediscover ourselves, and create a new world that works, in, in our democracy, we're going to have to see a big change in the Republican Party. That change may be coming, but it may not be coming too. I mean, you know, the thing is, you take a pathological person. Let's say, let's say Trump, for example, <laughs> um, and if he gets away with something, it's going to be more than likely that he's going to try it again. So take a, a pathological party, which is easy to connect the Republicans with with the Trump pathology. Um, and they go and they break into the Capitol. Um, they don't succeed, but in, in, they learn, they learn. And so, you know, you can you kind of expect they're gonna try this kind of stuff again. 
Well, of course, the Democrats can learn too. They can learn how to prevent this from happening again. But you have this ongoing tension between the possibility of the pathological result and the result of trying to, you know, correct that. Right. And, and to me, it's not clear that, you know, that we the capital is now safe. It's not clear that our elections are still safe. Uh, it's not clear that, uh, you know, that we are still safe with all those Second Amendment assault rifles in the streets. Um, yeah. So I think we're still at a balance point. That's why I was, I was telling you about the, the Ahus uh, at the top of uh, Mauna Loa. You know, you get to one Ahu uh, for navigation, and you don't know where the next one is until you get to the first one. Right. And so we, we don't know the success of our democracy here until certain things get done. And one of them has to be right now, the next Ahu, wherever it is, has to be the clarification of the Republican Party. Because right now, it is a total loser. It's all negative. It's all Trump. It's all pathological. And, and I think the country stands in the balance. Um, I don't know, you know, I mean, Biden is, is an admirable guy. His initiatives are admirable. His attitude, his kindness, his gentleness, his, his constructive approach to things, admirable. But query, can he function in the framework the founders established for us when the other side, which is going to, by definition, have a balance of power with them, have no intention of cooperating. Now, this happened with Obama, too. Their, their, uh, their approach was try to stop Obama from achieving anything. He's right. a black president. We have to show that he doesn't count. Yep. And they spent four years doing that, and in many ways, they succeeded. Right. Now, they could do the same thing, and, and that would really be terrible as far as the person in the street is concerned. The one we want to be confident of our government, who believes that he is part of it, it is part of him, it is serving him, and so forth. So I mean, right. to me, I think the next navigational point, and the critical one, it seems like it's a critical one every day, the critical one is that Republicans have got to shape up. Yeah, so let's talk Republican Party. So yeah, I mean, um, so you're right. I mean, uh, the Republicans have been the party of no for, uh, you know, for a decade, maybe a little more than a decade. And, and uh, you know, this, this refusal to cooperate has not hurt them until now. And now they're, they're going to be hurt if they don't do anything. You can see, so, so let's take, there, there's, a, there's several things we need to say about the Republican Party, but let's just take what's happening right now in the Senate with this, uh, the COVID bill. So if the Republicans were really, they wanted to destroy this, they would have never come forward with, with any kind of a counter offer, right? They, their, their, their concession speech was in their counter offer. It's like, we, we need to do something to appeal to, uh, to people who are really hurting out there. So they're, they're making all the kinds of concessions right now. Part of it is that Trump drove the Republican party in a different direction. Conservative, limited government, you know, uh, control over budgets. Well, the Republicans have never had, they haven't had control over budgets for, you know, Reagan and then uh, George W. Bush and now uh, Trump for the last four years. So the problem is that the Republican party has kind of lost some of its values and that the kind of core of conservatism uh, has really, Trump really began to tear at that conservatism uh, because he wanted a government that could, you know, that was very powerful, not a limited government, but a very powerful government. And he was willing to, you know, to spend any way that he needed to, to kind of, uh, to bribe the American people into voting for him. So, so the Republicans have, that's, that's problem number one, is that their core, their core of conservatism is, was actually under assault for four years. Now, you know, Trump, spun lies and spun lies so it wasn't always clear but now trump is not spinning lies and and uh, the republicans are having a hard time with uh with you know well we have to you know we, we can't spend money and all, all of a sudden we can't spend money now that the democrats are in control but like i say this this counter proposal uh indicates that the republicans are they're on shaky ground in terms of their values that's one thing. Can I offer another thought on that, John? Yep. They offered one third of what Biden has been pushing. 
And it's very clear. I mean, every everybody in the country knows we are in crisis. Uh, and the, the 1.9 trillion was not unreasonable. And if it was a little too much, so what? Um, there are people out there starving. Some huge number of people, including children, are starving. So they come up with one third of what Biden is asking for. And there's no justification. It's like numerology. You know, uh, what I mean by that is, you know, you practice law, for example, and you want to make a deal, go to the other side, and they throw one third on the wall without any justification or explanation. They're just trying to get you down. And I, I do not believe, I'm sorry, I, sometimes I, I want to believe that Susan Collins is okay, but she disappoints me every single time. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I think they were just playing. They were playing the Democrats. And I give Biden very high marks for blowing that off and saying, no, it yeah. wasn't sincere. I'm not negotiating with you. You're way out of the field of reasonable. So yeah. yes, they made an offer, but it was a stinky offer. And if it was an offer that a good lawyer saw crossing his desk in response to his offer, he would say, take a walk, I'm not doing yeah. that, which is exactly what Biden did and good for him. Right. So, and this is what Obama did not do in 2009, right? He, he, he should have done this. He should have been a little tougher with them. And he was not. Uh, the other problem that the Republicans have is that the civil war is commencing within the Republican Party. And uh, they're going to try to hold this line, right? Okay. As you, as, you mentioned, as you mentioned before the show, so you know, the QAnon supporter, Marjorie Green, is uh, she apologized today for her what she termed her past support for QAnon. Well, I don't think that's going to cut it. Uh, the Republicans, uh, you know, have attacked her. There, there are parts of the Republican Party that think she's fine. Uh, you know, so there's a kind of, uh, you know, you, you don't really know exactly how many Republicans are in that camp, but there, there is a kind of, uh, the kind of the crazy camp of Republicans, which is sizable, actually. It's either a sizable minority, it might even be in the majority at this point. But so, so you've got this, which is distracting and damaging Republican credibility. You've got uh, the, the Arizona GOP censured their own governor <laughs> and attorney general. Oh, funny stuff. So, so you've, you've got the Republican party beginning to, to fight itself. And uh, that's a that's a sure recipe for uh, you know splits and and weakness in a party. So so when, on the last show, I think or it was one of these. I think it was the last show when I said, look, one of two things can happen: that either the Republicans go down Trump Lane, they continue to go down Trump Lane, and they become a true minority party because it's uh, there are some other issues there with Trump that we'll talk about in a second. Or people like uh, McConnell decide, you know what, we got to take back the party from the crazies and there's going to be war because it's not like Trump is going to go away. And it's not like you can, the problem is with Trump, you can't split the difference. Okay. It's his way or no way. That's the way he's always been. So it, that's, that's not possible to just kind of say, well, we'll be nice to Trump, but we're going to be, a, we're going to return to the kind of normal party of, of conservatism and and you know we're just not gonna we're just gonna ignore this radical segment. The problem is the radical segment is big. Uh, estimated uh, thirty five percent of the voters of American voters think that uh, voter fraud uh, was significant in the last election. Okay, and they're almost all in the Republican Party, uh, and so that's that's. Probably 50%. It might be more than 50%. I mean, may, it might be 70% of Republicans. There have been polls that have shown this. This this actually matches almost exactly the percentage of Americans who wanted Obama impeached. 35%. So we so that kind of that 35% is out there, and it's you know, and the Republicans are they're going to have to deal with that 35%. Uh, and you know, you, you go like I say. So, so there's they're going to have to make a choice here. In the beginning, you're beginning to see that choice being made. Mitch McConnell, I think, believes that he can pull the party back together. You skim around the edges, uh, criticize somebody here or there, and then the party comes back together. But 
I, I think you know the the Trump the Trumpers that you, they're not going to put up with that. They're going to go after anybody who opposes them in any way. Two and, thoughts, uh, John. Yeah. One is um, you know history always moves forward. Uh, on think tank, we had um, Jack Balkin years ago. He's the dean of constitutional law at Yale, and um, I said to him, "Can't we can't we go back to the way it was before Bush? Uh, can't we just return you know to pre Bush day because Bush." Bush at the time seemed objectionable. Now Bush looks like a nice guy. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and he said, "No, no, Jay, you don't understand. It always moves forward. Yeah, everything that happens contributes to the the stream of. I'm sure you're familiar with the, yeah. the stream of history going forward. So you yeah. have to put, Trump is is built into our history, right? And January sixth is built into our history. We we have to cope with that. The country, um, you know, has it as part of its memory now." This is very, this is troubling um, yeah. because we can't get away from it so quickly. And you say that Trump will continue, but I'd like to offer you possibilities on this. Number one is um, Mitch McConnell wins and he exorcises Trump from the party. This will, the Republican party never gonna succeed with you. Um, and you're, you know, it's, it's, you're always saying Trump or, you know, Trump is, Trump is my way or no way. Um, so it's, you're a mess and, and you're creating a problem for me, for the party, for for the power of the, the conservative movement in the country. So you're out. And he wins. Let's say he wins. And Trump has to go away. At that point, does Trump successfully form the Patriot, Patriot Party? And, and I wanted to ask you about this since that came up, because I wanted to ask you, um, you know, how successful have these splinter parties been? Could Trump succeed in building the third party? The other possibility is Trump um, <clears throat> Trump just goes away. Is it possible that Trump could just go away? He doesn't have Twitter. Uh, and, and the question is, that's sort of my, my question about, about um, Bush. You know, could it be that we return to a time when all of this just sort of fades away and we go back to a more rational, kinder, gently, gentler America? Is that possible here? Or has Trump screwed it up in such a way so that we can never return. No, so so it's it's not just Trump. Let's talk about Trump, but it's not just Trump that's that's creating change in the United States. It's actually a Black Lives Matter. It's a protest culture. It's a, a, a leftward shift of the Democratic Party that they've been able to do with the leadership of Joe Biden. The classic moderate and centrist now is actually implementing policies that are more progressive. This is why the Roosevelt example is much better than the Abraham Lincoln example, because that's what happened to Roosevelt. Roosevelt was pushed, he responded to immense difficulties, and he became more progressive because he had to solve problems. And Joe Biden takes the same approach. He's gonna solve problems, that's very clear. He's He's not, uh, you know, he he's not so stuck on you know unif unifying the country or by by bipartisanship that he's not going to stop. He's not going to get stopped up uh, and not solve problems. So now, as far as Trump's concerned, you, you, the thing about Trump is that um, he still got political capital in the Republican Party. He does not have much political capital in the country. And yeah, he's been defanged because he's off of Twitter and Facebook. Uh, the Pew uh, Charitable Trust did a really solid polling about what happened to Trump's popularity after the, the insurrection. And it, the bottom dropped out of it. I mean, his, he was in the high, high 20s. So he was comparable to George W. Bush at the end of his tenure. Now it's, it might have popped up a little bit since then. But so Trump, is, Trump might be finished as a national leader, as somebody who can command, you know, uh, 47, 48% of the electorate. I think he's probably finished in that re regard because of the insurrection, but the movement is not finished. And so that's the, this is the problem is that you're still, you still have that kind of uh, the crazy 35, the crazy 35%. And it might be, you know, might not be 35%, it might be 25%. We don't know exactly, but You've still got that element there that'll they'll jump off a cliff for Donald Trump. So as far as going away, I'm not so sure that he's just going to go away. Um, and maybe 
if if Mitch McConnell does win, and McConnell's of course a much better strategist than Trump, uh, so he'll he'll take advantage of Trump's mistakes. He's not going to go, you know, hat in hand to visit Trump at Mar-a-Lago, and so it's possible that Trump would uh, do something drastic like uh, form a, a third political party, which which would be, you know, it would be it would doom the Republican Party at that point uh, because Trump would have a much more going political party because he had four years in the presidency. Uh, he's, he loves the organizing part, you know, going to rallies and stuff. And if he formed his own political party, he would much, be much more effective than, for instance, a Ross Perot. Ross Perot ran as an independent in, in 1992. Um, and, uh, you know, he, he did well. He got almost, well, I think it's 20% of the vote. Uh, and provided it really provided a victory for Bill Clinton. Uh, but, uh, you know, Trump's got more. He could get, you know, 30 percent of the this, this takes me to my last question to you, which, which I've been thinking about lately. I'm sure you have, too. <clears throat> so the likelihood is that Trump will be, uh, I don't want to say exonerated, but he'll be acquitted at this, uh, this yeah. trial next Wednesday. That's the likelihood. And there's a possibility it may be remote. Uh, it sort of depends on what, what McConnell wants to do and whether in the next week there are dramatic changes under the blanket with the Republican Party. <clears throat> and so maybe he'd be convicted. Maybe he'd be removed. I mean, permanently. Uh, that, would, that would be really terrific. My question is, what happens next Wednesday um, in that trial? Okay. A or nay? How does so that affect all of what we've been talking about. Right. It, you know, it's it's a little unclear to me because the lawyers that Trump hired and then fired, those were lawyers who were going to put forth the argument of election fraud, right? And continue to push that the, the, the election's illegitimate and therefore, you know, all the rest of this doesn't matter because Trump should still be president and there wouldn't have been an insurrection and blah, 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 blah. You know, these this kind of the conspiracy theory approach. Now, he let those people go, and yet the new folks came in and they seem to be pushing a similar line. And uh, you know, the, the Republican, the Republican leaders, including McConnell, have have signaled very clearly that what they want is for the Trump team to argue, look, this is this is an unconstitutional impeachment because he's already left office. And that's of course that's not true. Uh, the, the Senate has actually impeached. Uh, former office holders before, never a president, but the president is an office holder like any other. So, uh, so um, it's, it's not completely clear if Trump does take the approach that uh, this is all fraudulent and, you know, and the conspiracy theory approach, there might be a few more Republicans wanting to convict. Uh, because that's what, you know, they've made their wishes clear that, hey, you can clear this and we'll just We'll just kind of pat you on the back and send you on your way if you argue that this was this is unconstitutional. Period. End of argument. So we'll have to see. It's it's not clear to me. Um, but if he does go down the route of the conspiracy theories, then then the Republicans they have to choose again, right? This is this is Marjorie Green all over again, right? And Mitch McConnell might have to get up and say those are lies. Those are lying lies, and we're and I'm voting to convict. Or, or what do they do then? You see, this is the dilemma the Republicans have. They've lived under a guy who who couldn't tell the truth from the broadside of a barn, and now they somehow have to to squeeze these liars out of out of their party. And uh, you know, Marjorie Green might have apologized for now, but let's see next time. You know, uh, let's see. Not sincere. Yeah. So, okay, but the question is, if he is uh, acquitted, that presumably that would leave him in better condition to run again, uh, to form up, uh, you know, to, to have influence within the Republican Party, uh, you know, and other options. If he is convicted, presumably, uh, that would leave him with fewer options. And maybe that's the end of the Trump era if he is convicted. I mean, you know, uh, I don't have a clear feeling that one way or the other gives us a, a path to the next Ahu. Yeah, I, I think 
I can I can almost guarantee this that we have not seen the end of Trumpism. Not by a long shot. Not when thirty five percent of the electorate still wants to go that route yeah. or is susceptible to that route. So um, you know, it's I like maybe it's the best way to see it is that uh, uh, you know we we peaked. I think Trump's uh, political uh, le leverage and power has peaked. And I think he's on the downward slope. Uh, but, uh, um, and I think we can see, see a little ways ahead. <clears throat> the continuation of Trumpism, yes. The damage to the Republican party, yes. The inability of Trump to really, I don't think if he runs for president again, he's, he's not electable. Um, the, the Republicans have this terrible dilemma. I mean, it's the Marjorie Green dilemma now, right? They've decided that they're not going to be the party of conspiracy theories and lies because it led to an insurrection. So that somehow they have to get outside of that. And Donald Trump does not lead them outside of that. So the, the Republican Party is on the hot coals right now. They have to actually, they're, they're going to jump around and uh, they might survive as a party. I, actually, I, well, we'll see. I think under McConnell's leadership, they've got a pretty good chance of surviving as a political party. You know, all political parties disappear eventually. We saw a lot of this now, but we, of course, the Republican and the Democrats have been around for a very long time. Um, but uh, it, it, at a minimum, almost guarantee you that the, Rep the Republican Party is weakened by this. Um, yeah, and, and in, indeed, and, and at the same time, it's a funny association, a funny connection that as the Republican Party has weakened, so has democracy. <laughs> so, so has the country. We, we feel so fragile now because it isn't working quite right. They should be collaborating in Congress. Uh, they, they shouldn't be believing lies. All the, we, yeah. we have things, things in our midst that are very hard to um, reconcile with, uh, with a rational government. Yeah. Anyway, John, it just seems to me that the role of the historian has changed too. You know, they say the change happens faster now, and yeah. the role of the historian happens faster, too. It's not that you can dwell on things that uh, happened, you know, 100 years ago or 200. Um, the, the historian has to connect the dots from yesterday and tomorrow. It's yeah. different. Do you feel the pressure? No, actually, I feel energized by it. I mean, the role of the historian is so much more important than it was 10 years ago. Uh, we, we, we can be navigators, actually, historians can. So I actually, I've never been happier. <laughs> <laughs> and I've never been happier having you on the show. <laughs> Thank you so much, John David. And I look forward to our next uh, discussion together. Good. Take care. Aloha. Aloha.